Well, hello, boys and girls. It's when we feel eight o'clock. And uh, I'm Pearl of Wisdom, and you're listening to my NHL Pearls of Wisdom. And we have one of the finest in the land here. John, Mr. John from Off the Wall Hockey. And uh, I don't know if you've ever, if you if you have not followed him, I don't know what you're doing. You got you should be following him all day because he is fantastic. Especially when hockey gets going again and he's doing his lives. And uh, he, he does play by play. Mm-hmm. And I watch it all the time. If I got something going on and I can't watch the game, I'll throw it on John. He does play by play by I tried it on my live. I'm it's a gift. The guy is good. <laughs> it's I can't do it at all. I'm terrible at it. He's fantastic. So thank you, John, for coming on today. Thanks for having me. Great to be here. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I'd love to have any any time, buddy. But today we're gonna do some uh, winners and losers or losers in free agency. Although there are still a few players available out there. For the most part, the biggest part, uh, for the most part, is probably everybody's picked up who they're gonna pick up. We'll have a couple more a couple more players pop themselves in. But I thought it was a good time to look at some of the winners and some of the losers in free agency. So we're coming up with that now. Right now. We're doing it now. Okay. So let's start up. You were we talked beforehand here a bit because we tend to do that sort of thing. Yep. The first one that came up with you as a winner was the Toronto Maple Leafs, wasn't it? Yes, and as a Bruins fan, that's always interesting to say. But um, I, for the first time in a while, I really like what Toronto has done this off season. Um, I think you know we've been talking for how many years now that Toronto's defense has been a huge problem, and they go out and they get T.J. Brody, who I think can be a really solid addition to that top four. Uh, Five million a year, very reasonable cap hit. Um, I love the Brody signing, and that's an automatic upgrade over Cody CC and the other guys that they were playing in that top four last year. Yeah. Justin Hole, um, you know, Brody is a much better player than those guys. So um, mm-hmm. I, I'm a big fan of that move. I love the Wayne Simmons addition, a, a low cost, one year contract. You add him into your bottom six, and that is exactly the kind of player that Toronto desperately needed. Somebody who can you know play with um you know that that grit and that sandpaper that toronto's needed in their lineup for so long now but also can play the game you know well and the the 30 goal 25 goal days of wayne simmons are long gone he's not he's not 25 anymore like he was in philadelphia but he still can add so much value as a veteran leader and as a as a you know, gritty third, fourth line type guy who can also chip in offensively into your bottom six. And I think he's going to be really, really good in Toronto playing in that role. Um, I mean, they, they've made some really good moves this offseason. And I, uh, I really like what I've seen from Toronto. Zach Bogosian's another guy. He's, he's a depth defenseman. But we saw what he did in Tampa Bay this past, this past year, and especially in the playoffs. And you know, that's a solid sixth, seventh defenseman type depth move who, again, adds grit into this lineup, which they desperately needed. Yeah, I, I'm glad they got their head out of the butt and realized. I mean, I'm an analytics person. I, I watch analytics all day. I do enjoy it. But if you think for a second that having anal- only analytics and not having grit in your in your lineup in a hockey in hockey is going to work out for you, well, we've seen how that works out for you. It doesn't <laughs> it's work not good. Anymore. Uh, how it worked out for them when they lost to the Columbus Blue Jackets and look at who they added. Yep. Bart Goudreau and Coleman and guys like that and Maroon changed the whole structure of their team. And I agree. I think Toronto, at the very least, um, we'll see. Brody was having a downtime in Calgary, but most players were having a downtime in Calgary the last two years. So yeah. I'm going to say that Brody makes a rebound here being back in his hometown too. He's from Toronto. He's from Mm -hmm. Chatham, Ontario. So uh, that will be fantastic for him. I like the energy of that as well. Also Simmons as well is from the area and is, is uh, he has a child that lives in that area. So he's going to be happy there. So I like the way that brings that kind of energy to Toronto. And uh, I'm with you on that one. So let's go also to it. Let's go to another team uh, that, 
right across the board where they probably did well, but we're not completely sure, but we're still going to go with that anyways. It's it's not far away. It's called Montreal. Mm-hmm. Um, the Montreal Canadiens um, sure did a whole lot of stuff. Yeah. The question is, is that whole lot of stuff a plus or is it going to be a negative or do we even know? Yeah, I think right now it's a big question mark. Um, it remains to be seen with the Montreal Canadiens. They have now spent to the cap. They went out. They got Tyler to Foley. Um, they at, they re-signed Brendan Gallagher to a big deal. Um, so he's going to be sticking around. Toronto or uh, not Toronto, Montreal. Um, they're they're betting a lot on these moves working out. Jake Allen they brought in as their backup goaltender now, um, and they re-signed Victor Mete. I mean, they've spent their money. The, the cap space that they've had, they have spent. And yep. this is going to go one of two ways for the Montreal Canadiens. The Canadiens, if these moves work, if Toffoli comes in and scores you know, 25 goals and Gallagher has a 30-goal season again, if, if these moves work, Montreal could be a team that could compete with teams like Boston and Toronto in the Atlantic Division and end up having a really, really good season. If anything goes wrong, this could tank very, very quickly. Yes. And it would be a disaster if it, it really went downhill. And I think it's, we don't know. It's a 50-50 shot of which way it's going to go right now. I think the, the potential there is for Montreal to be a easily a playoff team and potentially a, a team that could even win a round in the playoffs next year. Or, you know, maybe even go further than that if Carey Price gets hot. Or... This could be a team that absolutely tanks next season and these moves turn out to be a disaster. And it remains to be seen which one of those ways it's going to go. Yeah, um, I'm, this is the reason why I'm saying like winners and losers. This is almost in between because yeah. uh, it's winners in the sense that, hey, ballsy, <laughs> you yeah. know, go out there and for sure trying to improve your team right away. Um, but it's a loser in the sense that you're when you say the word ballsy because it's also risky. It's risky. Yes. Very. That is the word. How can Josh and how do we know what Josh Anderson's going to be? And you're going to, how many years was it? Like seven it years at board. five and a half million. Yeah. That could be an absolute disaster contract. It could be. Uh, Tyler to Foley contract probably will be okay. I, um, I liked that one. Yes, and the good thing about the Tyler Toffoli contract also is that it doesn't have any NMCs in it. Mm-hmm. So if things go off the rails, at least you got something to Move. pull some assets out of and yep. stuff like that. Um, you do have, we, they do have the advantage that Thomas Tatar is going to be a UFA, so you can kind of make up a decision on that. Dano, I, I think they've got a little bit of a, a, a cushion in the fact that there's a lot of players that are up for RFA or UFA next year, mm-hmm. in which case this made these decisions maybe a little more palatable yeah. uh, because they have a little extra um, – what okay? What are we gonna do next year? We can not bring these guys back and do a retool or whatever. I didn't mind it, but I agree with you that if these moves don't work out and the possibility is very good, very possible. I shouldn't say good that they don't. Like Joel Edmondson didn't make it on a on a deep Carolina team. Okay, mm-hmm. it was a deep defense though. I'll give it that. But is he a three four? I'm not sure at this really the stage of his career if he should be on a good team's three four i think he's more of a five six at three and a half million that's not too bad but they really needed a top four yeah (laughs) you know yeah and and now they're capped out and they're rolling the dice that edmondson can probably elevate his game even more now that he's in montreal and that's a risk yeah, it's definitely a risk. I think of all of all the players, the two that I'm watching the closest are um, Joel Edmondson on the back end and Josh Anderson up front. Because um, Anderson obviously has had major injury troubles. We don't know what he is as a player. Um, you know, because really. he's been so he's been injured so much years. We know that he has the potential to be one of those big power forwards who can also score a lot of goals. 
but he hasn't been able to show it because of all the injuries. If he ends up, you know, being a, a, a Wayne Simmons type player, then that's a great thing for Montreal. If the injuries persist, then that contract is going to be a disaster very quickly. And mm-hmm. with jo- Joel Edmondson on the back end, you know, I think he's going to play with Jeff Petrie and it's going to be really interesting to see how that works out. Cause Edmondson's a physical guy. He's a good defensive defenseman who, you know, can handle things in his own zone, but you know, there are certainly deficiencies in his game and, and he, I think could be a number four defenseman. And if he plays with Petrie, I think could end up playing well in that role. Or maybe, you know, we see what happened in Carolina where he got pushed lower and lower down the depth chart. And if that doesn't work out, then that's going to be a problem giving him three and a half million to basically be a number five, six guy on your bottom pair. That's not what you're hoping for with the Canadians. So um, mm-hmm. those two guys are going to be you know, really interesting to watch this coming season and see how they perform in a Canadian's uniform. Yeah, especially when you're looking again, we were talking about uh, your top two centers are under 21 years old. Mm-hmm. I mean, there is a whole lot of ifs that come with that. So I'm going to give them a s- slight win for at least doing something, though, because yeah. Montreal was going to be poopty. So it was, you know, if they didn't do this, mm-hmm. then they're back in that situation where they're not going either way. Yeah, they're not. Yeah. They're not rebuilding. They're not doing something. So they said, okay, we're not rebuilding. At least they did something. I'm going to give them a win in the fact that they kind of, although it may look desperate, at least it's something. Yeah. Um, So talk about the new winner. We're going to go the opposite way. We're going to look at an organization that has done it completely different. And I think in a lot of ways, a lot more effective, the Colorado Avalanche. Um, this is a team that we're going to give as a win in free agency a lot to do with the fact that they didn't do all that much, right? Yeah, I mean, Co- Colorado was a great team to begin with, one of the best in the league. They they knew they didn't have to go out and make splash moves necessarily. Um, their main focus in free agency has been re-signing their own guys. They had a lot of restricted free agents, and they re-signed Ryan Graves to a very good contract. They re-signed Andre Burakovsky. They re-signed Val Nishushkin. They signed the, their own guys that they needed to get taken care of. And then they, they've been incredibly good on the trade market. Um, rather than trying to go spend big money in free agency, they've made phenomenal trades. I, I mean, if I'm another team's GM and and Joe Sackett calls me, I'm not even answering the phone because I'm probably going to get fleeced in that trade somehow. So, I mean, what Joe Sackett is doing on the trade market has just been phenomenal. Um, goes gets Dev, Devon Taves from the New York Islanders. The Islanders did not have the money to pay Taves and Ryan Pollock. One of them had to go. Yeah. Islanders are in a tough cap situation. You know, all the leverage in this deal is on Colorado's side. And they, all they give up is a couple of second round draft picks and they get a very good defenseman from the New York Islanders. And it's not like they desperately needed to add to that defense, but they just continue to make it a little bit better. And um, and then the deal with Chicago was an absolute steal. This right. this was an absolute steal from the Blackhawks. They trade Nikita Zadorov, who's a bottom pair D man, and I. I I like Zadorov. I think I like him a little bit more than you do. I like Zadorov as a bottom pair guy. I think he brings some physicality and size to a team's defense, but he's a bottom pair defenseman. And they bring back Brandon Saad, who is a top six, you know, really good second line scoring winger who can give you 20 to 25 goals still at his age in a season. And they just they instantly make their second line better with Brandon Saad. And all they give up is a bottom pair defenseman for it. So, I mean, Sakic is just killing it on the trade market. He's getting all of his own free agents re-signed to to good deals. They're still well under the salary cap. I think they still have about $10 million in cap space still. It's unbelievable what Colorado has been able to do. And they will once again be one of the top teams in the league next season. Yeah, and uh, I mean... Identifying Devon Taves, who his has is only 26 years old, still mm-hmm. has a considerable amount of upside, would be a top four on most teams. Mm-hmm. Uh, with Samuel Gerard and Ryan Graves playing the left side, not here. 
But yeah. now you have a top four defenseman playing in on your, your bo- bottom pair. Bottom pair. <laughs> yeah. That still can be signed probably for a reasonable amount, mostly because another thing that uh, Joe Sackick seems to do is he's the contract whisperer. Yeah. I don't know what he does to these guys. Is he drug their food? Samuel <laughs> Gerard making five million dollars a year for till the end of time mm-hmm. at twenty two years old. Like he just absolutely kills it in every single way. And I totally agree with you that Brendan saw a trade. He's only twenty seven years old. Yeah, it seems like he's older. <laughs> yeah, I know because he's been around for he's a long time. Been around for so long, years. but. Yeah. yeah. So he's only 27. You can sign him up, and who knows? He'll probably take a pay cut because Joe Saka said so. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> it's, it's I, I, I agree. It's, yeah. and, the, and then having all of that cap room. So the difference we have from Montreal to Colorado is probably Saka signs Taves maybe gives Yost a couple million or whatever the case may be, and still has $8 million worth of cap room, gives his goal to Philip Grubauer and Francois an opportunity for half a season to see what they can do. And if it's not working out, he goes out and gets another goaltender with this cap space. I mean, the difference between Montreal and Colorado is Colorado goes out and has options now. Where Montreal, if something goes south, they're, they no longer have leverage mm-hmm. to move players because everybody knows they're screwed, right? Yes. Yep. Completely agree. Yeah. Okay. So now those are those were our pluses, I believe. Yep. Uh, we're, we talked about it a little bit already when we talked about Montreal. Our first negative, unfortunately... Is your team, my friend? Yeah, the Boston Bruins. The um, Boston Bruins. Yeah. Um, yeah. What are we doing there, buddy? Uh, as a Bruins fan, um, I don't know. Uh, I I will say they've made one. The one big move they made was bringing Craig Smith from Nashville as a free agent on a three-year deal, just over three mil per year, and I do like that move. Um, secondary scoring was a major problem for the Bruins this past season. We saw it really come back to bite them in the playoffs. They could not get any scoring outside of that top line. And they, they've got to find ways to get goals from the third, the second and third lines as well. And I really like Craig Smith as a player. He's had a really good career with Nashville up to this point. He's been a consistent 20 goal guy and adding that into the Bruins lineup is a, is a good addition and a plus the problem is that's all Boston's done. And they, they lost Tory Krug to St. Louis, and they've done nothing to replace him. Um, Zdeno Chara may be coming back on a cheap deal, but he's, what, 43 now? I mean, he's a bottom pair defenseman at this point, if you even have him in your top six at all. They s- still have to do something about that defense, and they're kind of out of options. With, with Krug gone, I, I would say... At least free agency wise, the best defenseman left on the market free agency wise is Sammy Vatanen. I mean, mm-hmm. that's not that's not exactly going to be a huge. I mean, it certainly would be a downgrade from Tory Krug, and that's not something that's going to hugely help the Bruins. Um, but they got to fill that position with somebody. They could go out and make a trade possibly, but the other problem is they don't. They're not exactly loaded with cap space either. And while on the books, they do have a decent amount of space, they still have to re-sign Jake DeBrusque and they still have to re-sign um, Matt Grizzlick. So those are guys that are going to take up a, a decent chunk of that cap space that they do currently have. So they don't have a ton of room to work with money-wise either. And I don't think they've done anything to get considerably better. While you still have, you look at that division, you have Tampa Bay, who's an absolute powerhouse. You have Toronto, who we already talked about as winners and teams that I really like what they've done this offseason. You've got Montreal, who we just talked about, who I think, you know, if things go well, has a chance to really climb in the standings. And now you're talking about Boston and Florida kind of fighting for, you know, that third, fourth, fifth spot. You've got, you know, Bruins, Canadians, Maple Leafs and Panthers all kind of fighting for those those spots. I don't I, I haven't liked Boston's not really doing much this offseason. I think this was an offseason they needed to go out and get better, and they haven't really done that yet. Yeah, 
I will give it that the problem that they sort of were in a tight spot a lot of ways as well. Yeah, um, they were for sure. Uh, but you know, that's the thing is we're getting that feel. It's almost getting that feeling like the window's closing, right? Yes, and, very uh, much so. So, uh, you know, Krejci, uh, for you're going to be a UFA, is 34. Bergeron's 35. He'll probably still be good for a while. I mean, yeah. he's, he's unbelievable. But we, you still got Pasternak and, uh, and Marshawn, who are, you know, relatively okay. But it's getting there. And then, like you said, depth scoring. Bjork hasn't worked out. He's got to work out. Kasha's yep. got to work out. Uh, there's a whole lot of they got to work out here, including one that they have to sign in Nebraska. Yeah. Who, yeah. You know, they're, they're, uh, the biggest problem is, is their young players really haven't worked out the way they wanted to in, in Boston right now. And now they're kind of scratching their heads going, how are we going to fill these holes? And uh, I have to agree with you. I'm give, I got to give them a, a, a loser tag on here but um it's kind of a loser tag more to do with what they what's happened for around a them yeah yeah for a while now and around them that's a good way yeah a lot of people improve but it's been a while poor draft picks that just haven't worked out and yes. now they're in the situation where there's very little they can do losing krug for this team and now you know you'd mentioned chara this defense that was on paper looking like the best in the league, in the league. all of a sudden has <laughs> yeah. more, more Clifton, Lauzone, and Grizzlick as your four, five, six. It, it, those yeah. don't scream we're the best in the league anymore. Yeah, that the defense that everyone was talking about how good they were has drastically changed just in the past couple of months. And um yeah, it's it's an interesting situation. We'll see what they do. I will say um, there's a lot of rumors and talk going on now that they are in on Mike Hoffman and possibly bringing in Mike Hoffman. That would be a heck of a score as far as adding to that forward group if they could get a guy who's capable of scoring 30 goals in there. But I don't know if they have the cap space to make that kind of move right now. But uh, we'll see. That, that could kind of save their offseason, I think, if they could do that. But still, the biggest thing for me is losing Krug and not replacing that position with anybody. That's mm -hmm. a big loss for the Boston Bruins. Yeah. That being said, I really do like Grizzlick, and I think he has a lot more to offer. And he can fill that mm -hmm. role to a certain degree. But overall, actually, I was supposed – I was going to go from Colorado to Chicago because we were talking about Chicago. But that's okay. We can go to Chicago now because we say Chicago is a loser because we yes. were talking about the sod trade. But uh, Chicago, big loser here. Um, I will mention a little thing. I thought it was funny, kind of funny. Taves coming out, being all surprised that Chicago's going through a rebuild. <laughs> hey, nobody told me. I'm like, dude, fire your agent, okay? If you can't see that Chicago's going through a rebuild, like probably going to be going through a rebuild three years ago, nobody really should have had to tell you. But that being said, uh, it looks like they may be. And uh, it looks like the way they're going about doing it maybe not be the greatest. But uh, why did Chicago lose? Goaltending. That that's the biggest thing with me for Chicago is goaltending. Um, they obviously they let Corey Crawford go in free agency, and you know Sh Chicago is a team that I feel like could have been a borderline playoff team if they brought in someone to replace Crawford. You know if they. If they had even like a Thomas Grice type guy, they could have brought him in and, and, you know, had at least a solid goaltender there. Their goaltending tandem as it sits right now for next year is Malcolm Subban and Colin D'Elia. Those, I mean, those are those are guys that are barely NHL goaltenders. Never mind a start or any either of them being a starting NHL goaltender. I mean, they have no one in net right now, and all the all the goaltending free agents are off the board. I mean, you're you're looking at Ryan Miller as your and Jimmy Howard as your goaltending free agents that are remaining. It's not like they can just go out and sign anyone new now, anyway. So unless they pull off some magical trade where they bring in a starting goaltender, um, you're looking at Malcolm Subban and Colin D'Elia as the Chicago Blackhawks goalies next year. And that is not going to win you games in the NHL. Yeah, and we already talked about how they lost the sod trade. Yep. I think maybe you think a little less than me, but I, 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 th I really haven't liked Zadaroff in Colorado. 
Um, I thought he was going to be way better than he is. I do like, I mean, of course, the hitting and he can call, he brings some physicality, but he makes a lot of gaffes in the defensive zone. He's he's not really, it doesn't really have much offense to speak of. Mm-hmm. Um, I think it was a kind of a, I, I don't know, Maybe you couldn't get anything much more. Maybe they thought, okay, we'll bring Zadaroff in and we'll try to work him. We see something with him that we can make him to what he always thought we he could be, right? So I'll give him that. But I I don't I didn't like to trade. But I think they're losers more than anything. That um, to for me honestly, it's the dissension now that's going through that organization. That they weren't up front. This, there was, this was a very passive-aggressive way of saying, we're rebuilding. Yeah. Uh, we're just not going to have a goaltender anymore. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. And you're right. Like, I guess uh, How, Jimmy Howard is smacking his lips right now. <laughs> like, <laughs> I might, Sign me, Chicago. <laughs> I might actually have an NHL job. Wow, yeah. that's amazing. Uh, and that, that may happen because going into this season with Dalia Del- and Subban, um, I mean, Malcolm Subban has, tr- has had – this is his third or fourth organization, and he has failed miserably pretty much everywhere he's gone. Mm-hmm. Uh, Colin D'Elia had, a, had had some cups of coffee up there, and he didn't look bad. But like you said, no way they're winning with these two. No way. No, no And chance. if you're going into this next season with these two, basically Chicago is saying we plan it's- on taking the biggest draft pick we can get. Yeah, it's a, if you if those are your starting goaltenders for next season, you are in a rebuilding year. Absolutely, <laughs> no doubt about it. Yeah. So, um, I think it's the biggest lo- they're the biggest losers in the sense that they should have been a little more upfront with their their people to, or their players to tell them that this was the plan and um, do it. It's time to do it, anyways. I, I Jonathan, uh, d- uh, give Patrick Kane an opportunity to win a cup out there because this rebuild is going to be absolutely horrific, mm-hmm. honestly, for Chicago. Now it's going to be a long rebuild. Um, although it's nice to have Kirby Doc. Yeah, and, yeah, they've got know. some good young players there, but that that core of Kane, Taves, and Duncan Keith. I mean, that they're, they're aging so much at this point, and. Um, I, I can't see them winning again with Chicago. No, it's t- yeah, and it's time to move on. That's where I really think it's the biggest loser, uh, maybe even the biggest loser, maybe not, because we have one more to talk about, and uh, that would be the Calgary Flames as the biggest losers um, in free agency. And for one, and we're going back to goaltending here again. Uh, <laughs> Risky. On a different level, though. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Jacob Markstrom, Markstrom, $6 million for the next five years as a 30-year-old goaltender. What do you, we already kind of know what your thoughts are, but kind of. I mean, what a, what a risky move for the Calgary Flames. I mean, a, a, Markstrom had a phenomenal year last year with Vancouver. He had a phenomenal season. Mm-hmm. But before that, he was a very average, mediocre goaltender. He was not one of the you know top guys, and and he goes out. He has one spectacular season last year, and now you're going to give him a six year deal at six million per season based on that one year of great play. I mean, this just honestly, this is this is a Montreal Canadiens type move. Like this this has the potential to go downhill so quickly. Um, it, I've, I said this to you earlier, it reminds me a lot of when Cam Talbot went to the Edmonton Oilers, but on an even bigger scale and an even worse contract. And we all know how Talbot's time in Edmonton went, other than that one year that they were good. Um, yeah. The rest of it was an absolute disaster. And I have a feeling that there's the chance here for Markstrom in Calgary to be an absolute disaster. Uh, I totally agree with you. And, and it's not just for that. It's to combine with the whole makeup of the team. Mm-hmm. Um, Johnny Goudreau has looked like he 
he says otherwise, but it doesn't look like either one of them want to have him there almost. Like, it's very weird situation going with Johnny Goudreau mm -hmm. there in Calgary. Last year was really bad. Sean Monaghan, I've said, has been overrated center for quite some time. At least not a number one. He's more of a second guy. Yeah. And I, I think Johnny Goudreau, is, Goudreau has actually propped him up quite a bit. And he's got a lot – Johnny's got a lot of flack for his inconsistency last year and the year before. I don't even think it's Johnny's fault as much as the, what he's got to work with around him besides Matthew Kachuk. Mm -hmm. Matthew Kachuk is gold for this team. Yeah, It's like you go through their lineup and it's like Johnny Goudreau, Kachuk, great. Then Monaghan, eh. And then Backlund as your second-line center, really? Yeah. He would be a third line in most. Most, uh, yeah. Then you've got Elias Lindholm, great. And then Derek Ryan, oh. It's, it's, <laughs> like, it's an up and down, weird mishmash. Noah Hannafin's never turned out the way he wanted, they wanted him to yep. be. Then you got Rasmus Anderson, and you go, yay. You know, it's like, and then they sign Chris Tanov, and it's like, <sighs> no. Yeah, no. Tanov's, that signing's another one I don't love. I, I mean, it, they lost TJ Brody. They brought in Chris Tanev. That's a downgrade. That, yeah. That's a downgrade at that position there on defense for Calgary. And they get Tanev at half a million per year, less than what Brody got from Toronto. But still, Tanev's, he's been good at times, but he's shown a lot of inconsistency. And he's 30 years old now. And he it, he's not going to go up. He's not he's not ascending like Rasmus Anderson is. He's he's going the other way now. And I I just I don't love that deal either for for the Flames. And I think they they took some big risks this off season. And I just I have a bad feeling that they're not going to work out. I would actually say they're almost wor they're worse risk than Montreal. I think like, yeah. Montreal made some moves like Toffoli that could, that really is not that high of a risk. But yeah. almost every move that Calgary made looked like desperation and a big and a big risk. Even like taking your third stringer as Louis Domingue. I mean, uh, Louis Domingue yeah. is is again not a go not an NHL goaltender. He's proved it over and over and over again. Um, so. I would say the biggest loser for me is Calgary in all of this. Um, uh, Boston being maybe a, a little bit on, maybe a little bit behind them. But to me, also because Calgary just makes moves like this all the time. It's almost as they're, they're, they're the wor biggest case of one step forward, two steps back mm -hmm. organization that there is in the league. And they just continue on doing so over and yeah. over. Well, boys and girls, that's our full 42%. This has been John from Off the Wall Hockey, and it's been fantastic having you, my friend. Uh, you just did a video I haven't even got to yet where you're talking about some of the best pickups, or underrated pickups. Yes. In the, and uh, so everybody go check that out right after this. Right after this, you're going to go check that out. And uh, you're going to check out all of other stuff. I think next time I'm going to hopefully go over in, on, on his land and do a channel, do something with him. So you can watch that over there. But for now, this has been John from Off the Wall. I'm Pearl of Wisdom. You guys enjoy your summer and all the great action that we're going to be giving you with all the moves that are coming up. Have a great day. Lots of love to you.